Sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. Thank you again for joining me here at the back of the range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 35. I am back in the United States, pretty much over the jet lag at this point, after getting in some great golf and rest and relaxation in one of my favorite cities in the world, St. Andrews, Scotland. Had a great time at places like North Berwick, Scotts Craig, the New Course, Eden Course, the Castle Course, and then wrapped things up over at the Dukes. I took tons of pictures and videos while I was there and posted a lot of them on our Instagram page. So I hope you all were following along, but if you aren't yet, well, damn it, get it together. Follow us on Instagram at the Back of the Range Podcast. You know what else we do on Instagram? We give stuff away. Yes, free towels on Tuesdays. We have these great caddy towels with our logo on them, and we are just getting rid of them as fast as possible. So keep a lookout on Instagram, and you never know. You just might win some free stuff. Just my little thank you for your support of this podcast. When you tell people about the podcast, you can tell them that you can find us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. The central hub of the podcast, where you can learn about our podcast and listen to all of the previous episodes, head over to thebackoftherange.com. So on to this week's episode. While I was in St. Andrews, in between pints of Bellhaven and a strict diet of fish and chips, I actually managed to record a couple of episodes. And there's no better time to release one of these episodes than right now, the first week back. So this week's guest is Sheena Willoughby. Some of you may not know her, some of you do. So let me give you a brief introduction. Sheena, along with her husband, Jack, owned the Dunvegan Hotel in St. Andrews. While they just recently sold it, they are staying on as brand ambassadors. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ben, you've had PGA and LPGA Tour pros on this podcast, nationally ranked amateurs, collegiate coaches. You even let Joe Buck on the podcast. Sorry about that, Joe. Now you're having some lady that owned a bar on the podcast? Absolutely. Because the Dunvegan is not just a bar not just a hotel, it's the most famous bar in the most famous golf town in the world. You may have your favorite 19th hole, but this one is just a chip nine iron from the old course. Everyone has been in this place to raise a pint, presidents, major champions, celebrities, you name it, they've been there, and their picture is on the wall to prove it. Now, you know we like good stories here, and Sheena has tons of them from her nearly 25 years of experience running the Dunvegan with Jack. Not only stories from the good times, but also the amazing story of how they actually acquired the Dunvegan. This episode was recorded right inside the bar last week, so if you hear some background bar noise, well, yeah, that's background bar noise. It was an enlightening and entertaining behind-the-scenes look of how Sheena and Jack Willoughby turned a slightly run-down pub into the most famous watering hole in the world devoted to the game of golf. So, Sheena, thanks for making the time to join us here at the Back of the Range. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, absolutely. So, um, my first trip to St. Andrews was in 2015. I came over to play the Eden Tournament, quickly found myself in the Dunvegan just about every single night. Um, It is is clearly just a special place for golfers traveling here. Uh, the, The story of how you actually came to own the Dunvegan with your husband Jack is just as interesting as the place itself so can you give us just a little bit of history of your 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 start in in the the industry of of running a hotel running a pub running a bar how did you get how did this happen well Jack and I (laughs) where do I start I know Jack and I worked in the oil field service industry up in Aberdeen Scotland he more or less followed his paycheck over here and we were working for the same company and um, we used to come down here on weekends to play golf and we'd always hang out at the Dunvegan and Jack actually had um, come down here prior to us he was captain of the Aberdeen Petroleum Club up in Aberdeen okay and he would come down here with all the guys and you know he just developed a love of golf and a love of the Dunvegan way before I came on the scene. Anyway, once we got together uh, together and started coming down here, we would always hang out at the Dunvegan. And it was always such a great atmosphere. It had a great buzz. But back then, I mean, this is like 25, 26 years ago, it was a den of ill repute, really. 
it was like sticky, <laughs> sticky linoleum on the floor, oh. smoky. When I say dirty, I don't mean dirty as in filthy. I just mean it was just a dive. It was a weathered, weathered bar. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. It was weathered. But it was always a fun place to hang out with the neatest people. And the caddies back then um, would all come in here after the rounds and come in with their golfers and they would sit for hours and tell stories and drink pints and pints and pints of Guinness one after the other. So, like I say, we always warmed to the place, great atmosphere. And then eventually we would stay here too. And then we'd drive up to Aberdeen Monday morning thinking, golly, why did we stay in that hotel? It was a great fun place, but it was badly run down. The, rape, the showers, you hardly got, it would blow hot and cold water. Um, the towels were like so thin you could see through them. You know, it was that kind of place. Sure. It was a dive. Okay. Anyway, moving on from that, the owner, we were sat at the bar one night having a few drinks. And um, the owner said he was looking to sell. And of course, Jack just pipes up you know, we'll buy it. And I looked at him as if to say, are you nuts? We had we had good jobs up in Aberdeen. Right. And um, anyway, we spoke to him in the morning and uh, the rest's history, really. It was uh, being in, <laughs> I like to think of it as being in the right place at the right time, but, um, sure. you know, the first four or five years in the hotel were really tough and I kind of thought back to that day and I was thinking, it was the the wrong place, the wrong place at the right time. <laughs> well, and and that's you know, for anyone that has not been here, it is truly just an absolute. Um, it's almost a museum, so to so to speak, because of just all the history on the walls. I mean, just pictures, and we're going to get into that a lot later. But you know, one of my immediate thoughts is, how could a pub that is literally 150 yards to the 18th green at the old course ever have a problem? succeeding like how could it get run down how could it not be always like this that it was 20 you know you bought it 24 25 years ago yeah. uh, you know what were some of the growing pains that you had when you first started well well first of all we have to thank tiger woods okay. big time because tiger's not here today no, I, he's thought, not. I really thought he was going to show <laughs> up for this but uh you know I, <laughs> um no no we really do have to thank tiger because when we bought the hotel it was just as Tiger's career took off. Sure. And although it's the home of golf in the hotel, I'll correct you on this, it's 112 yards. My apologies. That's okay. My apologies. Um, 112 yards from the old course. I mean, golf just kind of took off, really, with the infusion of Tiger Woods on the scene. Yeah. And Jack, to this day, would say to you that he could not and cannot believe how a property this close to the most famous golf course in the world was affordable to, at that time, to, you know, the ordinary working man. Right. And like I say, it was the right place at the right time. The owner didn't look for any hassle selling. He was happy to sell to us. Um, and, you know, like you said earlier, we were customers. We were good customers. We could drink a pint, but we certainly didn't know how to pour one. Well, so we came into this thing, cold turkey, just thinking, oh my God, what have we done? What have you gotten into? But Jack kept saying, you got to roll the dice. you got to roll the dice. If we don't do this, we'll regret it all of our lives. And I'm thinking, do you think? Because, <laughs> well, you're coming from two really solid jobs, like you said. Yeah. So you had no experience running a hotel, no Absolutely experience running none. a bar. None. Have you ever worked in a bar or restaurant? No, no, we did not. But when this was all on the go, Jack went and took a bar job in one of the busiest bars in Aberdeen, um, the Earl's Court Hotel, which was just a haven for oil field. And he'd get there on a Friday, Friday afternoon, because that was like Saturday night to the oil field people. Sure, okay. And there were so many um, uh, purchase orders, handshakes in that bar on a Friday afternoon over a few pints. But he, granted, he went and worked there. He'd worked there on a Saturday night just to get a feel for pouring drinks, really. So, and then I took a job up at the, up in Newborough, up, where uh, Trump International is, okay. almost. And um, I went waitressing. <laughs> so you, you go know, for I your... was working for free. 
So you go from being like in a, you're an executive assistant for, I think, yeah, for the CEO I work of for this. The, the, yeah, the vice president of the company. Okay, so you're like, you're like an executive assistant and yes. now you're, you're like cleaning bathrooms at the Dunvegan Hotel and, and running food orders yes. and, and taking care of drunk people. Had a mop bu- and bucket. Yeah. It went downhill at the beginning. <laughs> well, that's just what you have to do. Sure, sure. So you, you, you get into, you get into this and you, one of the other questions I have for you is like, I know your your location here is great, mm-hmm. but there are plenty of pubs within a two minute walk from here. Yes, they're right here. Was it a conscious effort to turn this into something completely different and give it a, you know, a, a golfer's haven? Like, what was your mindset from a business standpoint? Like, how did this become what the others just around the corner aren't? Well, we had a business plan. Okay. We had a strategy. Okay. And our business plan that we put together to present to the bank, and we got kicked back a few times, to be honest, but we wanted to turn this place into a 19th hole for golfers, 112 yards from the old course. And we figured that with our, like with Jack's business mindset right. and my hands-on day-to-day operations mindset, with a lot of hard work and a lot of luck that we could accomplish this and turn it into a 19th hole for golfers where people could come in with their golf shoes on, with their golf caps on, and be in an environment where we would show golf on TV and go above and beyond in customer service and just have a fun atmosphere for golfers. Yeah, this is one of the, the one of the things that uh, I've noticed here. I've been here three years in St. Andrews and, and spend so much time here is just the customer service is great, but not, it, it's in a way where they are completely in tune with the clientele. They, they give you the needle, you they take it back and it's just more of a family atmosphere and it's more friends than, than anything. So when you were hiring people, you can't just have someone that knows how to pour a drink. They need to know how to take care of the customers that are coming in here. Absolutely. So, I mean, what was your hiring process like when you're trying to build this new face of the Dunvegan? Well, we used to, um, we would really interview, you know, 10 people to get the right one. Sure. Because we wanted personality. We wanted somebody that could, you know, have at least some knowledge of golf and just kind of look like they were enjoying themselves. Sure. And I think in any walks, any walk in life, you get out what you put in. And we tried to make it a fun atmosphere and a fun atmosphere to work in for our staff as well. Sure. So you, you make the you make the turn. Um, you, know, you said the first four or five years were were pretty challenging. Well, yeah, they were because what happened was, like I said earlier, it, the place was a dive, but it had it had it was a fun atmosphere. It was a dive, but the the people that were in the bar when we took over, sadly, and we we got a lot of flack for this. We had to kick them out to get people like yourselves to come in. I mean, we just had to. So we went from going, we went from having a clientele that was kind of rough and drinker, heavy drinking crowd and swearing and fist fights and goodness knows what else, sure. to no clientele because we had to kick them out. And we weren't very popular in the early days. And the worst thing that we did, actually, it was heartbreaking, was that we refurbished the hotel too early after we took over because we were still suffering the backlash from the people that we'd kicked out right. as, as customers. Sure. And it was not personal, but with this vision that we had for the hotel, there was no other way to do it. Right. And, you know, that's one of the things that, to this day, we regret that we had to do, but... With no choice. You had to, in order to accomplish your goals of where you wanted this to exactly. be. Exactly. So, um, you know, the, the day after our first night, really, our opening night, you know, the, the, um, the seats, because it was smoking in the bar back then. Sure. Um, the seats were burnt. The carpets were burnt. And I, you know, I looked at Jack the next day. I was in tears and I said, you know what? This is not worth it. You know, these people hate us. You know, Jack was referred to as the Yankin town. Right. And there was a lot of, um, you know, 
There was bad feeling in the early L- days. Little pushback, exactly. Because you know, Jack is. You know, we haven't gotten into. To, you know, obviously, you're you're native of Scotland. Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. And Jack is a native of Texas. Yes. And uh, so it, you know, you got this Texan running the a pub right next to the old mm-hmm. course. So yeah, I could totally see how yeah. in the early days that was a little bit of uh, a pushback. But you know, the first four or five years, you're getting things fixed up. Now, when did can you? Pinpoint maybe a time when things really started to take the turn for the better where, you know, you're starting to, to yeah. really see. Well, what we did was after we got to the stage that we had no customers, Jack and I would be practically, I mean, this is true, we'd be out on the doorstep as people were walking by because it, this place wasn't on the radar for, uh, you know, people that were here on golf trips through tour operators to come into. Right. I mean, the, the tour operators back then probably said, well, no, you don't want to go to that place. Right. So we're out on the front doorstep and... You know, back then, Jack would be wearing a shirt and tie, for goodness sake. <laughs> and, um, you know, we try and, you know, just, you're just coach grab, people, you're just grab grabbing people them the off street. the street. It's yeah. like we had fishing rods. And we'd get people in, and then we'd um, we'd talk to them and tell them what our goals wa- were. And then we'd say, look, we've refurbished, we've remodeled. And the one thing that we felt that what a golfer needs is a comfor- comfortable bed, a great shower, and great towels yes so we had great big fluffy bath sheets we had put in power showers back in the day nobody else had them i don't think even the old course hotel had power showers back then um no disrespect to mr kohler of course of course um but we put in power showers and we had big beds extra firm mattresses and then we would start to show the customers what we'd done upstairs Sure, okay. But then we had a stumbling block as well because they'd go back to where they were staying and then they would be talking at breakfast in the morning saying, hey, we stopped in by the Dunvegan last night. Jack and Sheena are there, you know, a real nice couple, whatever. And this is what they're doing. And then we had the stumbling block that these people then came back to us, the owners, saying, hey, you're trying to steal our customers. And, and now you're, and getting, you're getting those So now we're fe- getting that flack. And, right. and there was nothing further from the truth. We were just enthusiastic and wanting to get the word out about our business as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Well, you have so to do we that. had a lot of challenges and stumbling blocks in the early days. But gradually, then we contacted the tour operators and um, they started come visit with us and then they started to put their customers in here and then once we got that flow of traffic um it began to grow and grow and then steadily and steadily we began to get the clientele in that we had envisaged right from day one right and in fact later this month towards the end of august and it's a shame that we're going to miss him but our very first customer his name was called charlie hinnett and he's back here at the end of the month and literally what happened was the phone rang and it was the bank to say the money had been transferred then the current owner handed us the keys and then literally we just had the keys in our hand we're looking at each other thinking well we've done it now (laughs) and this guy walks in and asks for a cheese toasty and that was charlie so yeah 25 years ago now. so you still remember and still know your very first customer that's well that's impressive for a business to to have (laughs) that's that's crazy um so, so one of the things about the Dundegan here, you have a, you know, your menu is you get the standard fare that you can get just about anywhere else. You can get fish and chips all yes. over town, and you can get, uh, you know, uh, ale pie and and a lot of the staples when people come here. Mm-hmm. But your menu also has a lot of American flavor. Yeah. And how did that come to be? Is that, I mean, when you're married to a Texan, I can't imagine there's going to be a shock. There's going to be some steak well, and burgers rolling around in here. The last thing that we wanted to do was Americanize the place. Okay. And, but at the same time, we have to recognize that in St. Andrews, the golfing clientele predominantly May through August are Americans. Of course. Um, I would say late March, April, early May, we still get a lot of Scandinavian customers because it's still cold and they can't golf. Mm -hmm. Um, Europeans, predominantly Scandinavians though. And then we get to May, after the the spring medal, the spring for the Arnie, right? The the spring meeting, I should mm-hmm. say, and after they're done, that's the floodgates open for all these Americans coming uh-huh. in. So we wanted to give them a flavor of a flavor of what they're used to back home without Americanizing the place. Right. So that's what we did. That's why we introduced nachos 
onto the menu right. and recognize that we're a golf place. We're not a... Our customers are hungry. They've played golf. So they want to come in. They want to have a steak sandwich, a chicken sandwich. They want to have a BLT, fish and chips, steak pie. They don't want dainty food that they're going to be hungry food. an hour later. Comfort so food, yeah. I call it man food. Okay. I see. <laughs> there you go. They're man food. Man food. And then at night time, we put in a great char grill through uh-huh. in the kitchen. And um, we specialize in char grilled steaks. So we have a really nice dinner menu. And we have a signature steak, which again has a little Texas influence. Of course. Eight ounce filet, jalapeno peppers, melted cheese salsa, and oh. a mixed herb sauce. It's to die for. All right, I know what I'm doing after we record mm. this. So, I'll uh, give you a discount. Oh, oh wow, well, how about that? <laughs> I got to tell you something else about. Well, that's a different story. So, uh, one of the things that is is so amazing about this place is that um, uh, the pictures on the wall. Yes. Probably one of the most notable things about the Dunvegan when you walk into the pub, after you get yourself a pint, you start looking around. If you don't look at the TVs, you're just looking at the walls. There are pictures all over the place. It's you with, um, and, and Jack as well, but mainly you with, with a lot of uh, famous golfers, celebrities, people that come through. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me who is the first picture? Well, our first uh, photograph was... Freddie Couples, Steve Elkington, Curtis Strange, um, Tom Kite. Tom Kite. Yeah, Curtis Strange, Freddie Couples, Tom Kite, Steve Elkington. That was our very first picture. And how that came about was that the caddies, their caddies would hang in here. Okay. And they'd get talking to Jack. And then they'd go back and say, hey, there's this yank that's bought the hotel up around the corner from the old course. We need to go in there. <laughs> so then they brought their golfers up. Right. And that was the very first photograph that we had. And, of course, Tom Kite, he's a Texas boy. There you go. There, so Jack and he had this great conversation about Texas and Texas A&M football right off the bat. So sure. there was a connection there with an American affiliation to the hotel with my little Scottish input too. Right. So that was our very first photograph. So, th- so this tradition starts where you're just getting these pictures with all these players. So yes. this is probably going to be one of the uh, easiest uh, interviews I'll have to do because I can just basically name a player, and you're going to probably have some sort of a story about them being here in the pub. Pretty much. Okay. Not so, always ones I can tell. Well, we're gonna <laughs> we're, we're we're gonna tell some good ones, not an overly <laughs> embarrassing ones. So let me see. Let me throw a uh, a name out at you. Let's go with uh, Justin Leonard. Well, Justin Leonard came in. Um, again, he knew that Jack was here, Texas, Texas boy himself. And uh, he came in. I think originally the first time he came in, he was with Brad Faxon. Yep. And again, just the affiliation, Jack being here, they felt comfortable. It was a little taste of home for them. Sure. And the big thing back then was that we had ice. Everybody always, I know it's the weirdest <laughs> thing, and it's just a small thing. Yeah. But, you know, if somebody asked for a pint of water, I mean, we'd fill the glass up with ice and then top it up with water. And, I mean, that just seemed to work for us. Just just what they're used to at home. Right. So they were comfortable coming in here. So let's see. Who else? Um, Henrik Stenson. Henrik never really said much when he came in, to be okay. honest. He was pretty low-key. Okay. Not, there's not much of a story there with Henrik. All right. Who... who uh, Okay, so let's talk about some guys that, that, that talk about some people that have come through that are a good story. Oh, Laura Davies. You got to give me a good Laura well, Davies Laura story. Well, Laura Davies, that was, that was unbelievable. I actually was invited to play in the Pro Am at the Women's British Open right. in 2013 when Stacey Lewis won. And the Ladies Golf Union, they gave me a choice of playing with Yanni Singh, who was a customer here, and I knew, knew Yanni. Or playing with Laura Davis, but it was a, a non-brain, non-brainer, really. Yeah, so I got to play with uh, Laura, and it was unbelievable. She was super nice. Played, we just we just had fun. I mean, I was petrified because when I saw her, she was kind of like thundering towards me, and I was like <laughs> shaking in my shoes, thinking, "Oh my God, Laura Davis!" You know. She's. Uh, but um, she was as nice as could be, and we had fun. In fact, sh- that was the first time she'd actually ever played the old course. Okay. She never played it before, which is hard to believe. 
And um, of course, you know, when you're playing Lynx golf, you can putt 60 yards. Oh, of course. And I played the old course so many times at my level of golf. I knew how, I know how to play Lynx golf. So I would rather than, you know, take a wedge and fly the ball, I would putt and reduce damage, really, sure. damage limitation. Of That's course. my thinking. Of course. So eventually, when I was hitting these 60 yard putts and, you know, getting them up to the hole, and eventually she put her hands on her hips and she turned around to me and she said, you know what? Sheena, if I was to hit the ball and you were to putt, we would win this tournament. Done. <laughs> Done. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I thought that was kind of cool. Absolutely. But, yeah. And, of course, that year, Stacey Lewis was staying with us. We've been very fortunate. The first Women's British Open was held in 2007. And um, Lorena Achoa was staying with us. Sure. And all her family. And we had the place decked out in Mexican colors and everything. And, uh, of course, Lorena won. Right. So we were one for one. And then Stacy stayed with us during the Women's British Open 2013. Right. And she won. So you've had all these players that not only they come here and play the tournaments in St. Andrews or Carnoustie mm -hmm. or surrounding areas, and they come in for a drink, but you've had a lot here, here stay. Absolutely, yes. So, well, during the tournaments, to be honest, like during the, the Open, it's just too big and too busy. And we're right. a, our bread and butter are the the golf fans. So our place is busy. It's noisy. We have to get our deliveries at four o'clock in the morning because um, the streets are, there's no traffic allowed on them. Right. So it's not a place to house, you know, professional golfers that need their sleep. They're trying to win the open championship. Right. So um, we've been fortunate that we've had a great customer relationship with Titleist and every open that Jack and I have been here. We've had Titleist stay. So we hope that continues. And in fact, um, the new owner, his brother, is vice president of Titleist. So I think, I the think connection continues. I think that'll mm -hmm. continue. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, Plus, it's good for golf balls. Of course. I bet. It, I bet you're not <laughs> running out of Pro V ones anytime soon. No, I'm soon. not. No. <laughs> so as far, so let's see. Let's talk about some of the other famous golfers and celebrities that have come through. Let's talk about Clint Eastwood. Oh, nice one. Give me, give me yes. a good Clint Eastwood story. Yeah. Well. It was funny, he was up at King's Barnes golfing and we got a call to say that he would be coming down. They gave us a heads up. And of course we were thinking, oh, oh wow, Clint gosh. Eastwood. So he came in and oh my goodness, you're just like starstruck. As much as, you know, the professional golfers coming in, you know, you just think the good, the bad and the ugly. And, of course. You know, the music. Dirty and, Harry and, you Exactly. Know, so sure. here's Clint Eastwood. He comes in with his family and sits down and he had fish and chips. And uh, funnily enough, Last week, this couple was in the bar and they were asking where his photograph was. And uh, they were good, good friends of Clint Eastwood. And they mentioned that he'd called me Queen of Fish and Chips Queen back of, then. Yep, yep. So that came up in the conversation. So it's amazing just, like you say, this small bar, small hotel, so close to the golf course, just anybody who's anybody from whatever walk of life wants to come through here at some point a bucket list destination yeah. and they're looking for a hangout and there's believe me there's lots of great places in st andrews to eat and drink of course unquestionably i don't know we've got a niche and a brand the brand strong it seems to be getting stronger year by year yeah. um to the extent that we may have to knock some walls down do something i don't know but maybe part of the charm is the size well, you mentioned the size. Mm -hmm. I, I like I like coming here for lunch before going out for an afternoon round because mm -hmm. it's nice and quiet. You can sit, you can you know have a couple of conversations. But at night, this pub gets pretty packed. It does. And you can't move too well. Um, you get to know people pretty quick because mm -hmm. you're standing pretty much right on top of them. And that's not even during the weekend when there's maybe a PGA Tour event or you know the Open or a mm -hmm. European Tour. What is the craziest and the most crowded you've seen this place i know there's over 25 years there's probably many many examples but if i had to come here at for the the craziest done vegan experience well that would have to be during the open i mean okay. that's just nuts right it's actually too busy but really? um there, there's just Ryder people cup? everywhere well the Ryder cup's a fun weekend to be here this year of course it's in france so it's going to have a different atmosphere because when it's held in the States, it's on TV late afternoon, nighttime, when people have come in from golf and then they're having a few beers and they're fired up and they're looking forward to watching it on TV. Yep. 
in France, it's going to be played. There's an hour difference. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty sedate during the day. People are not as, not maybe not raucous, but it's a different atmosphere when it's on live during the day as opposed to nighttime. So we'll just have to record it and <laughs> play it again at night. There you go. People come back in. What, but that's uh, a fun, that is yeah. a great tournament. And of course we have, you know, we, we, we're, we love golf. And Jack being American, we've got the stars and stripes up. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we've got the European flags up too. So we're yeah. kind of pulling for both. What uh, what was one of the uh, professionals or celebrities that's that's come in over the years that was coming in because they were so excited to see you and Jack because they heard so much about the Dunvegan that it kind of surprised you that they were making a special trip to come see you or kind of kind of shocked you? They they've just heard of the Dunvegan. They want to come in here, see the atmosphere. They've heard about the pictures on the wall. They want their picture on the wall too. Sure. Um, but I mean, notable people like Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon. I mean, to meet people like that. And you've is, met presidents. Um, presidents, I know. I've still I've met the current one. You have or you haven't? I haven't yet. Okay, well, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if I can help you with that. He does live right around the corner for me down in South Florida when he's not at the White House. Mm-hmm. But uh, but you've you've met uh, President Clinton. I know you've met President Bush. I I have, yes. You've met, well, actually, what happened there was all his, actually yes. both. Okay. his uh, security people were hanging out here at night time when they were off duty. Okay. And they told Jack and I that he was going to be outside the RNA in the morning real early. So we get out of bed like 5.30, get down to the RNA, and there must have been a couple of hundred people, you know, the steps up to the RNA. Absolutely. Everybody was standing by the steps at the RNA. So Jack and I come down and we just go along the 18th green. Sure. So we're standing there. We're a two ball, hundreds of people further along. Well, here comes President Bush, and he comes out of Walden House where he was staying with his security. He gets onto the old course and comes up and makes a beeline for Jack and I. I was wearing Jack's Texas A&M sweatshirt. Of course. And, of course, his library is in College Station. Right. So he came up and he said, whoa, an Aggie in St. Andrews. And I said, no, sir, I'm not an Aggie, but Jack is. But we are Aggies. Would you mind having a photograph with me? And he said, not at all. So we had the photograph taken. That's amazing. And he was very, very, I mean, that's 25 years ago. He was a handsome, handsome man. Yeah, that's incredible. And of course, we had the blessing of the security people too. That doesn't, yeah, that doesn't hurt yes. when the Secret Service says, sure, no problem. Um, let's see, story, story, stories. Okay, um, I'm just going to rattle off names. Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. Well, back then... When Tiger first came in here, he was with Mark Amira. Right. And again, just the just the connection with Jack, really. Um, Mark brought Tiger in. That was a great night. Um, he had dinner through in a restaurant. In fact, we did fajitas for him that night. He asked for fajitas. And Tiger was really nice, was happy to pose for photographs. And um, we actually went down to Muirfield and had a photograph, got him to sign one of the photographs down there, actually. But, yeah, Tiger's given us a plug a couple of times. I think he's got mixed up between the Rusaks and the Dunvegan, because he talked about coming up 18 in the Dunvegan, but I think he meant to say the Rusaks. <laughs> nice. But, yeah, he's, he, and like I say, our business took off when Tiger, you know, sure. his, his career. Well, and, and you know what's interesting is that, you know, if I'm a professional golfer, and I'm here in St. Andrews, I may not necessarily want to come to a place where there's going to be a ton of golfers. Mm-hmm. I may want to go find some restaurant that's a little bit quieter. Maybe I'm not going to have a lot of people, you know, coming up to me. I think that's the case, but secretly they want to come in and have their picture on the wall. Nice. So how, how is the crowd here? How are the client, your other customers when they're just here and they're just, you know, all of a sudden someone pops in? We're, well, we're really fortunate. I mean, golfers, predominantly are really nice, good people. Right, respectful. You know, they're, they're respectful business people, um, people from all walks of life. But generally, a lot of the guys that come here, it's a bucket list destination. They're happy to be here. They're easy to look after. And if somebody famous does come in, there's a little bit of a stir, but it's not like it's 18-year-old kids going crazy right. over somebody. Right. So it's all manageable. Sure. For sure. Can you think of, uh, let's see, who notoriously would shut the bar down? That that would be... So, so. Well, 
like I said, there's some know, tales some, I can't some story, tell. I, yeah, no, no, I, but, I, 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 but you know as well as me now that golf has changed. Like, take a, a look at Brooks Kopka for for a start. Exactly. I mean, he's spending a lot of time in the gym. In the gym, I was yep. always saying the gym. Just like his, <laughs> in okay, the gym, <laughs> a lot of times in the gym. See, in that's the, the stories we no. want, Sheena. I want to know that Brooks Kopka drinks gym. gin all day. That's what I want to know. So, I mean, you can tell. Sure. And golf's changed, and all these young guys are, you know, they're fit, they leading healthy lifestyles. Well, when we took over, the golf pro just didn't quite have that image. No. It was different back then. Yes. So you'd get people like Ian Woosnam, Ernie Els, Nick Price, some of these guys coming in. Uh-huh. They're the ones that shut the bar down. Great fun. I mean, back then, Ernie, I mean, he wasn't married. He would no responsibilities. Sure. And there was one Dunhill um, Cup where Ernie was playing, and they were all having a drink in the bar. And then Ernie decided that he wanted to go and play the old course late at night. So he took a six iron. He got a six iron from Jack. And he and Jack went out on the old course. Of course, the security people came with their torches uh-huh. to sc- you know, say, what the heck's going on here? Oh, it's you, Ernie. Yeah. Oh, we're just playing the first hole. So he, they played the first hole at the, the old course, like at 2 o'clock in the morning, pitch dark with a six iron. Kind of fun things used to happen back then. That's great. And the reason that we have our logo, only a nine iron from the old course, yep. was because some customers regular customers decided that they wanted to question our logo. So they got out there with a nine iron and started hitting golf balls down the first green of the old course over the rooftops. And I went to, I was in bed and I heard all this ruckus outside thinking, what the heck's going on out there? And this was Jack and all these guys hitting golf balls down the street. And there are things that happened back then that I couldn't imagine happening nowadays. Just because, just it, because it's a di- it's just different. Different now. time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not that it's any worse or any, you know, it's just, just different. Just different. Things change. Yeah. Oh gosh, let's see what other names. Uh, give me a good Jack Nicholas story. Well, he's never been in here, but You're his sons. Have, no, me. he's never been in here, but his sons have been in. But his lifelong friend Arnold Palmer. I mean, Mr. Palmer. He's been so good to jack and i over the years in fact he walked in unannounced one day just out of the blue this guy comes walking through the door here's mr palmer and what had happened was his lifelong caddy tip anderson had passed away and mr palmer couldn't get to the funeral so he sent flowers and on the card he put goodbye old friend ole goodbye old friend arnold palmer right so we had a plaque tip had his own seat yep in the bar there around the corner so we put a plaque up um, with Tip's name on it, and we put on it the sentiments that Mr. Palmer had written on his card, goodbye, old friend. So um, that was kind of special. Yep. Anyway, he came in, and he wanted to toast Tip. Yep. So he bought himself a half pint. We said, no, no, we'll get that for you. But he insisted on paying, because that was the kind of man he was. Sure. So he had a half pint, and then said cheers to Tip. And then... Amazingly, he went outside the front door and sat down on the bench You're on the patio me. outside the hotel. Well, you've got Arnold Palmer sitting outside on your patio and all these cars going up and down and we're all honking their horns and, <laughs> you know, it was just amazing. And he just sat there and then people would come up and again, there was a, there was a crowd gathered outside on the pavement and uh, he would sign autographs and things. But our first open was 1995, and it was the Arnold Palmer course design people that took our place, not took our place over, but they camped out here. Right. And um, I don't know if you'll remember a guy who worked for, for Mr. Palmer called Ed C., who passed away. He was a taller, taller life. I remember uh, Doc Giffen, his personal okay, assistant. Yes. I remember Doc Giffen. I don't remember Well, Ed. people in the... Um, course design okay, world they'll okay. know of ed c yeah and uh, it was funny mr palmer was hosting a, a cocktail party at the old course hotel and they were all staying in a house ed c um the palmer people had rented a house on the other side of town and they were supposed to be at this cocktail party at the old course hotel so they called here frantic they couldn't get a taxi because they didn't plan ahead sure and they couldn't be late you know for mr palmer so um, 
I went and got my car, which back then was a little Ford Fiesta. Uh-huh. So it was like one of these adverts you see on TV about pen people piling into this little car. Uh-huh. And I drove them down to the Old Course Hotel and you had to get in line. And there was like Bentleys and all sorts of huge and- fancy Rolls Royces <laughs> and everything pulling up at this reception. <laughs> and here's us in our orange Fiesta. Gets pulled up and they all pile out of the car and... Um, you know, go to Mr. Palmer's reception. But sure. it was just to be fun days. Yeah. We used to have a real laugh. And still do, but different days. Yeah, of course. Um we're we're in our we're recording this right now in a pretty special room here um at, at the Dunvegan. So uh this is kind of a room where I guess when you have guests that are arriving or leaving they, they leave their clubs. But this yes. room also is a I guess it's the uh, permanent display of one of the local artists, uh, David Joy. That's right. And uh, just looking around, and, and for listeners on the podcast, uh, there'll be a lot of photos uh, kind of set up in conjunction with the audio portion of this, so you can kind of see what I'm looking at. But David Joy, tell tell everyone what to, what David Joy does, who he is. Give me got to got to give a plug for for David. Joy. Well, David Joy, what we see about David Joy is, hey, we knew you before you got famous. Yeah, but David Joy, local golf historian artist he is so talented just now he he's recovering he had a severe stroke um but he's making a remarkable recovery and um just lately he completed that picture over there of francisco malinari winning the open at carnoustie but the pictures that are on the wall the photographs the illustrations that are done david had this it was an exhibition it was held down at the golf museum but in 1995, they needed more room to do a feature on Jack Nicholas, So David brought the whole exhibition up here, and it's been here ever since. And he's just added to it as the years have gone by with the new Open Champions. So that's kind of the theme throughout the bar. Um, below all the professional golfers in the bar that have come in, um, the walls feature photographs of the Open Championship, mm-hmm. which then runs into here with all the Open Champions, going back to um, Tom Kidd, um, I think in 1860. Yep, there's, so, there's Hagen and there's, uh, there's Peter Thompson. And, yes, goes and, back to 1873. Yeah. So this is kind of like David Joy's room. Yeah. And we're real proud to uh, host these illustrations here. And then, of course, a restaurant's called the Claret Jug, and in there... The photographs in there are of the Open Champions with the actual claret jug. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and then the the amazing thing also that David Joy does is he's actually does a uh, he's an he's imperson- an actor. he's an actor and mm-hmm. he's a, he impersonates old Tom Morris. That's so right. for people that have a little bit of history and knowledge, if you've seen a commercial. I believe it was a golf travel company that he did it for. That's right. So it was old Tom Morris, and, and I've actually was here one night when when he came in in full costume, and it's. It's absolutely incredible. It takes hours for him to put that makeup right. on, and that beard. Yeah. And, I mean, when he walks through that door, I mean, he just captivates the whole... I mean, that bar could be jumping, and then suddenly he walks in, you could hear a pin drop, yeah. and then he gets into the story of old Tom. Yeah. And funnily enough, a few weeks back, Jack and I went on a trip to the Outer Hebrides, and we went and played a golf course that uh, Tom Morris... Um, built out there. He he did the design for the sure. golf course, and it's called Askernish, mm-hmm. and um, an amazing golf course. It's like a Bali Bunyan, a Cruden Bay, a Trump International. Uh, goodness, all in one course. It's not manicured, but oh my goodness, if that was a manicured, right. had a lot of money spent on it, I mean, that would be an unbelievable golf course, and mm-hmm. it is in its own right. But Jack and I, it took us five ferries to get there, and we just kind of wondered, how in the heck, back in the day, did old Tom get this distance? Of course. Unbelievable. So he's quite, uh, you know, to think what Tom Morris accomplished back in his day, what he could do now if he was alive. Oh, gosh, yeah. With, Unbelievable. With, uh, absolutely. So you play, you know, you play a lot of golf around town. Mm-hmm. You're, you're a... 11 handicap? Nine. Nine? Man, I'm just... I'm hanging in there at nine. Hanging in there at nine. Mm -hmm. Single digit handicap. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of Americans that come over here, it's a bucket list. They want to play the old course. But tell me about some of the other courses in the area that you play on a regular basis that that people need to make sure they they play and then come in for a pint. Well, I mean, (laughs) to be honest, Jack and I now are really 
we're, we're managing to play a lot of the courses out with St Andrews because we now have the freedom and the time to do so. Uh, sure. And he and I have been up to Castle Stewart and um, we're members up at Dornach at Stree Course. Um, we're looking for a membership up there. We went to the Outer Hebrides. Um, we went to Makrahanish last year. So we're kind of catching up on a lot of people who've been doing golf trips right. for many years because we've always felt that during the busy golf season, we needed to be here and wanted to, wanted to be here with our customers. And our time off was in the winter time, which fell in line with college football for Jack. Yeah, so we're going to get to Jack and his <laughs> Texas A&M uh, yeah. uh, addiction pretty soon. Best of both worlds. But in and around St. Andrews, we tend to play... You know, the old and new, the Jubilee, the Eden. We go up to Kings Barnes quite a bit. Absolutely love Kings Barnes, the people up there, uh, the service, just the whole package up there is first class. Mm -hmm. So friendly, and you catch Kings Barnes on, I mean, any golf course, but you sure. catch Kings Barnes on a super day. Oh my goodness, it's unbelievable. Um, Lady Bank, Crail, Ely, okay. they're all courses that I've been playing recently. Good. Love Crail. Balcomi, Craighead. I played in the Scottish Amateur at Ely earlier this year, and I love Ely. It's a great golf course. So, yeah, we're just kind of getting out and about ourselves now. What's been your greatest playing accomplishment in your, in your golfing career? And what did you do to celebrate? Was there a pub maybe that you went to to have a... <laughs> Well, I've kind of won a few tournaments at club level golf. I mean, that's sure. my golf. It's my hobby. Right. But I work hard at my golf. And I'm so fortunate that through the hotel, the people that I've got to meet, that I, I go on a trip every year with Mickey Walker, who has been Solheim Cup captain uh -huh. for several years for the European team. So I've got a great friendship with Mickey and go on a trip with her, which includes coaching and playing golf. And then... I, you know, I take lessons. Well, I'm just I've, thinking I've won about quite you. a few things with my club, right? Golf, and I won the Northern Ladies Open at Carnoustie one year wow. when I was playing off 12 and shot 72, and won the handicap section. And so I've got a few trophies. I'm just thinking about, you know, you have all these pros that come in here. Yeah. Have you ever just pulled one of them aside and said, you know, I'm having trouble with my chipping. Do you have any advice you can help me out with? Or like, I'm, this, the bunker play is just not where it should be, you know. Um, you know, they come in here and one thing leads to another. And like two years ago, Nancy Lopez was here. And she does Nancy Lopez Golf Adventures. And she had a group over here staying up at the Fairmont Hotel. Okay. And they all come in. They were hanging in the bar. Great fun. And um, Nancy and her fiancé at the time, Ed, they were playing the old course the next morning. And I said to myself, hey, Nancy Lopez is playing golf on the old course. I'll have to go and watch this. So I went out and took photographs and um, just, you know, a legend. Sure. Took lots, lots of photographs. And I always remember on 16, and you'd think by this time, her caddy would have known how she played. So they're standing on 16 and um, they're looking down the fairway and Nancy's got her driver and she's leaning on the driver like this and uh, the caddy's saying to her, right, you want to play it way left and you know, take the principal's nose out of play and she's looking and she's just right down the fairway and she says oh, you don't want me to just play a cut shot and take it round the bunker right. you know, you'd think by 16 he'd know, he would know so anyway, thing. she gets up on the tee and just plays this cut shot right over the bunker, didn't even look at it, you know. Right. And then she turned around at me and she just winked. It was hilarious. I've never forgotten that. And then we got to 17 and then she and her playing partners all went up on the Swilkin Bridge for a photograph. And then she went like this to me and I got invited up, wow. up onto the bridge and we had a photograph taken. It's just on the door there, you'll yep. see. So we just had a great connection. And to me, Nancy Lopez is like the Arnold Palmer of women's golf. Absolutely. She really is. Absolutely. Her love of golf and the game and people and love of life yep. is extraordinary. So anyway, so I was looking at her website and subsequently she did a trip to Ireland early the, earlier this year. And I thought, you know what? I need to do this. So I went on a golf trip with uh, 35 Americans, four Canadians, and myself, okay. met them all at Shannon Airport for the most part. We stayed at the Killarney Park Hotel. Right. And once I got there, I knew half the people that were there. Okay. Because they'd all, was, they'd all been all in been the been bar. They'd all been in the Dunbegin, yeah. And it, was, and it was just a great, great, great week. And we played 
Ballybunion, Waterville, Tralee, Killarney, and Old Head. And then, you know, getting back to your question, what happened was myself and my two playing partners, we were on the driving range getting ready for our tea time, hitting a few balls, warming up. And then Nancy pulls up in a golf cart and she says, hey, I'm your fourth. Oh. Well, oh my goodness, it was so unexpected. There's no way I thought we'd be playing. So I got to play nine holes with Nancy Lopez and, you know, it's just something that, you know, you'll never oh, forget. absolutely. So that was really special. That's, uh, um, that's but I've just been meet. so fortunate that, as I described, it was my birthday last week and you just feel part of this huge golf family around the globe, especially with social media nowadays and Facebook and right. people posting things. And it's like these people are in your living room half the time and you just feel part of this huge golfing family around the world. And you I've managed to do that by Jack and I having this hotel. Right. It's opened so many doors and now we find ourselves having sold the hotel that we're flying the flag for the Dunvegan we're on our travels and we meet customers when we're out and about. I was just going to ask you, what is probably one of the strangest places that you've bumped into a customer? Well, most random, but like unexpected. Unexpected I recently was kind of bars in Killarney, really. All these guys were in the bars and tightlist hats on, obviously golfers. And um, all you hear is, Sheena, Sheena, you know, and I think, golly, who's that? And customers. Yeah. Um, it's just a small world, the golf world. Yeah. And even when I was at Waterville, um, they've got a small driving range there. You're hit off mats. And um, I was there and got talking to this guy that was beside me. He was an American that comes to Waterville and plays every year. And then all I heard were, are you the Aggie's wife? Nice. And these two guys were further over. And they're, they said, oh, we're coming to stay with you in two years. So it's just amazing now that getting out of the four walls of the Dunvegan and Jack and I being able to travel and having more freedom, like I say, that we're meeting customers past and future and we're flying the flag for the hotel. So right. as much as it was bittersweet to sell and it was very emotional, I can um, imagine. you have to look at the next chapter in your life. But the great thing was that the new owners, Gil and Andrew, they recognized Jack and I's 46 years of experience between us, and they wanted to capitalize on that. And we agreed with them that we would stay on as ambassadors of the hotel, helping where we could, come in at night time, talk to customers. Jack likes to come up in the morning and at breakfast time um, and see the guys before they go off and play golf. And um, no, it's uh, it's amazing to to see how this has uh, taken shape. Or I mean, twenty five years coming from really no experience in the hospitality industry to create arguably the most famous pub and and famous most famous nineteenth hole in the world. So so there's a couple of random questions that we always ask to our guests, and and I have to ask you because I know you're you're a huge golf fan. So uh, Jack Nicklaus won the Masters in nineteen eighty six at the age of forty six. Compare that to Tiger Woods if you would win another green jacket. Which victory would be the more, most substantial? I would have to go with Tiger. Yep. Yeah. Yep. In fact, you know, the PGA this past weekend, Brooks has been in here a few times. Um, you know, you, you want the best player to win. Sure. But, oh, my goodness, the, the crowd, the, the, the support, and the, I mean, it's like hysteria. They, even, they, at, even at Carnoustie when I was over there for the Open, and the crowd that Tiger pulls, unbelievable. Yeah. And the energy, and it's just great for golf. It's Absolutely. exciting. It's, it's exciting when Tiger's playing. Absolutely. Who, um, so who would be your dream foursome? If you could pick three people that have been, three of your, your I'll give you four. Pick a foursome, and you could be their fifth. I know you can't play a five on the old course, but for this case, we'll play a five on the old course. So, pick four of your fam of your favorite customers from the from over the years. That that I know is a tough one, but uh, give me give me four that you wouldn't mind going to play a, play around in the old course. Oh my goodness! For sheer fun and just a, 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 a interesting round. Well, I would have to say first and foremost, Mickey Walker. Okay. Solheim Cup captain. Yep. And she's actually the, the junior Solheim Cup captain next year um, at Glen Eagles. I would have to, I would have to say um, Stacey Lewis. Okay. Because Stacey's supported us 
the last several years, again, invited me up onto the bridge when she won the Open. Her mum and dad are great ambassadors for the hotel. The whole team, the American, it's this affiliation with Americans that keep coming up, but they, they're the ones that really support us here. And um, after the Women's British Open, they always announced the Solheim Cup team. And uh, Julie Inkster would come up here and all the, the team would be in the back restaurant eating pizza and drinking beer. And she would have a rah-rah, you know, yeah. I was like a fly in the wall. I was yeah. thinking, golly, how lucky am I being a European? Sure. I'm a fly in the wall listening to uh, Julie Inkster give this speech to her Solheim Cup team saying, you know, they're going to come at us. They're, these Europeans, they're, they're, they're strong, but we're going to be stronger. And I'm right. thinking, whoa, this is you're fabulous. Getting kind of worked up, getting, yeah. I know. So I would have to say Julie Inkster. I'd love to play golf with Julie. So Inks, She's a legend. Yeah, yeah. And um, I would have to say, I'd have to, I can't get by Nancy Lopez. That yeah. would just be unbelievable. That would be some foursome. And Laura Davis. I could go on and on. I know, I know. I could no. go on and on. No, there's uh, there's just so much history here. What do you, uh, so what do you think, I know this is a really impossible question, but you got to leave the Dunvegan and you can only take one picture with you. Which picture would it be? Arnold Palmer. Wow, that was an easy one. It would have guess, to be. I guess that was an it easy one. It would have one. to be. Okay. And I'd maybe have Clint under my arm. You can take the picture of you and Jack from your wedding day on the Spoken. You can take that one, <laughs> hey, that's too. That's maybe the one I should have yeah, said. <laughs> we'll, we'll edit this one. No, no, we'll leave this in. So, <laughs> so th this bar has a lot of history, obviously, and, and people will come here with, with fathers and fathers and sons and, and grandparents will, will spend time here, you know, being, uh, you know, just toasting each other. Give me uh, maybe some unique uh, aspects of this bar where... Um, you know, maybe someone's toasting someone that they lost and, and, and loved ones and, and how special, you know, that aspect is to the Dunvegan. Well, let me start by saying that when Jack and I took over the hotel, we knew the old course was special, but we really didn't know what we were getting into. And sure. as the years went on and on, it really became clear to me how much the old course meant to people from all walks of life that wanted to come here as a bucket list destination to play golf. And I began to try and instill in the in our staff was that any given night in that bar, everybody has a story. There's people from all walks of life. You don't know what's going on in their lives. You have fathers, you know, guys that come on golf trips with their buddies and then they'll come back two years later. Something's happened to one of them. They'll bring the ashes over. They want to spread the ashes over some of the golf courses that they played. You have father and sons making the trips. You have um, sons that then come over here with their father's ashes. And then you have guys in the bar that planned a trip with their father and never got to do it. So they come over, have their father's ashes in their golf bag, and then they go and play all the golf courses that they had planned to play. And he feels they, he has his dad with him in the golf bag and then puts this little box on top of the bar with a malt whiskey on top and toasts his dad. We have people that are recovering really now, this last couple of years from September 11th that have moved on. You have guys going through crazy divorce settlements that when their buddies say, oh, come on, let's get away from this. We're going to St. Andrews to play golf. So yeah. like I say, there's a lot of stories that there's things going on in the bar. And usually, usually because it's guys on golf trips and they're away from home for a week and they're away from the pressures of family life and the pressures of working life, they're easy to look after. And if there's one guy that's a little bit, what dare I say, being a little bit of a jerk, there's usually a good reason by the, that you find out by the end of the night what's going on with him. Right, right. And he may have three months to live. Yeah. Things like that become clear as the night goes on. But... Um, there's this family from Tallahassee that um, they brought the ashes over. Their dad passed away. Sleepy Die, the Die family, it's a big um, uh, lawyer uh, firm in Tallahassee. Okay. And the, the father passed away, Sleepy Die, and they brought him over here and sprinkled his ashes. And Sleepy had always had a great time in the bar, that the sons all felt that they wanted to leave a part of their dad in the bar. So we've got Sleepy up there in a little, I don't know if this is illegal or not, but anyway, we've got <laughs> Sleepy up there in a, a sealed urn up beside the malt whiskies. And then 
Subsequently, we had a group of guys that came over from Chicago and one of their buddies passed away and they did the same thing. They spread his ashes and he always had a good time in the bar. So he's up there too wow. in a little sealed urn. His name was Mike. His photograph's actually on the wall. And then just latterly, there was a group here earlier this year and um, they left their ashes as well, or their friend that passed away. So that's what it means. It's like, it's, it's hard to describe for me in words what golf and guys on buddy trips, it's a unique thing. You have to, wit you have to witness it. Sure. And as much as, you know, guys like hanging out with girls, vice versa, guys on buddy trips, there's this special bond with them all. You'll know what I'm talking oh, about. Of course. And I see it all the time. And um, that's what it means to these guys to bring their buddy over here and th th bring ashes. So that's really special. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, I, I've been told I should do this. So since you're, you're passing the torch to the new owners, but there is a, no, a new young staff here at the Dunvegan. Yes. So these are the, they're, they're going to be the new face, so to speak, in the upcoming years of, of the Dunvegan. So when I come in the bar and I see um, – uh, guy like Luke. Mm -hmm. Tell me something about Luke that our listeners need to know when they come here to the Dunbeacon. Well, Luke's just a great guy. You know, he's 28 years old now and um, I like the, I'd like to think he's kind of sown his wild oats and he's settling down a bit now. But Luke, Luke's a great guy. Um, since Jack and I sold the hotel, we've kind of had a little, you know, it's kind of been a little challenging with us being hands off and sure. the new owners, they're Canadians. Um, but the, the, the people that know this business the best are our full-time staff who have been with us for several years. Sure. Luke on the bar, Mark on the bar, Linda at breakfast time, um, Natalie, who like is kind of heads up all the weight team. So they've really stood up, and Gil has just been here, and they've stood up and said, you know what? We know this business. We know the brand. We've been trained by Jack and Sheena. And we want to continue with the values and the service level and everything that's been instilled by them in us. We can take the hotel forward and make it, they keep saying, make the Dunvegan great again, which I think is quite funny. Nice. But um, I know, in fact, at my birthday, they bought me, a, they gave me this hat. It says, make America great again. <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. But um you know, they, they know what the Dunvegan is, what it needs to be going forward. The attention to detail, the customer service, yep. ice, everything. Ice. Yeah. Pictures on the walls. Yeah. Don't start messing with the pictures. That's what no. people come to see. Um, the collages, they're quirky. Um, that's what the Dunvegan is. Yeah. So they get that. So, you know, they've got Jack and I, hand on heart, we all feel, hey, good luck. We'll support you. We're with you. We'll be on the sidelines. It's going to be challenging, and there's going to be days when things break down and you have to deal with them, but they're up for the challenge, and we say, hey, good on you. We wish you well, and with the support of Gil and Andrew, they're going to come over from Canada more often. Jack and I will be here all summer. I'm going to be here longer next year because I'm here for the Solheim Cup at Glen Eagles. You're That's an assistant be... captain, I hear. Is that correct? <laughs> not quite. Oh, not quite, okay. <laughs> but um, it's going to be hard to know who to support that week, to be not, honest. That's, that's right. But, um, yeah, it's it's going to be fun. And the atmosphere is great in here. The staff are happy. And um, th 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 there's a good buzz. And I've, yeah. I've got great um, – I've got a good feeling about – the Dunvegan going forward. Good. Well, that's a perfect way to wrap up the episode. Sheena, I really appreciate the time. We'll have to do this again next year. <laughs> uh, get a, get some more stories from you with your golf travels. And uh, yeah, I think the Dunvegan is in really great hands. So I appreciate you joining us. Hey, okay, thank you for having me. Thank you. And there you have it. Another great episode here at the back of the range. Our first one recorded in Scotland. Thank you so much to Sheena Willoughby for taking the time to join us while we were visiting the Dunvegan Hotel. If you're in St. Andrews, you got to go check out the Dunvegan. That's all for this week. We'll see you next time here at the back of the range. <laughs>